So I'm going to be talking about walrus, which I'm sure many of you know in, in just general terms, but one of the most, um, the, the title of this talk, Tooth Walkers, is actually based on the uh, walrus teeth, we call them tusks, but they're actually teeth that walrus have that are some of the most distinctive characteristics of them. Um, when we don't realize, it's hard to tell from pictures, but these guys actually weigh about 2,000 pounds, and um, they can grow up to about 10 feet, 12 feet long, so they're really big. Um, and they played a really critical role in the prehistory of Alaska and uh, across the Bering Strait in Chukotka, part of the Russian Federation. So I wanted to just give you sort of a brief introduction to what walrus are. Uh, they're marine mammals. They've got these really distinctive tusks, which are actually canine teeth. So canine teeth, just like your dog has, just like you have, except they're sort of hyperextended. They're these giant canine teeth, and they're very specialized. Um, so they're, we call them tusks, but walrus ivory. They are come in a lot of different sizes, depending on the size of your walrus. So we have um, smaller female walrus and larger male walrus with different sized tusks. And tusks have been a subject of a lot of research because biologists haven't been always quite sure what the purpose of these are. Um, tusks are sort of expensive to maintain in physiological terms. So why would you want to carry around not only these really long and sort of unwieldy tusks, but also um, they're, they're expensive, right? They're expensive to carry and maintain. Um, they tend to get sort of chipped and broken. Um, so why would, you, why would you carry around these tusks? Well, here's a picture of, of one possible reason, which is they're great for fighting other walrus, mostly for males fighting other males um, in d dominance displays, especially when they're fighting for mates. So that's definitely one of the reasons. Uh, another reason is literally to use those tusks to grab onto the edge of ice flows and pull yourself up, okay? So here's a relatively, uh, walrus with relatively small tusks, but female, especially female walruses, as well as males in certain times of year, tend to hang out on ice flows. And one of the ways that they pull their massive, bulky 2,000 pound bodies up on these ice flows is by digging these tusks into the ice flow and then sort of maneuvering themselves onto it. Uh, they're incredibly strong. If you have a chance before you go, take a look at some of the tusks that are actually laid out um, over in the, side, in the corner there so you can see just how, how heavy they are and how durable they are. Uh, here's a walrus skull. And not only are these tusks pretty amazing uh, elements, but the skull themselves is, the skull is just incredibly thick and heavy. It's, at, it's, it's really hard to pick up if you try to pick one up. I, mean, I don't know that you go around trying to pick them up, but um, I do. And they're really heavy. They are just massively dense bone. Um, and it's a really unique adaptation from a biological and evolutionary standpoint. So, Pretty much, walrus are, are pretty cool when you get down to it in terms of, of um, just general old creatures hanging out. Walrus are neat, okay? Um, here we have a distribution map of walrus with the red being where walrus presently live today. And you can see that much of the coast of Alaska is walrus habitat. There is also a lot of walrus in, uh, over here in the eastern Arctic around, this is Baffin Island. So that's a different subspecies. There's only one species of walrus in the entire world, and depending on who you talk to, it could be one, or two or three subspecies. So they're pretty much a polar creature, and um, as I said, they've been incredibly important in the prehistory of Alaska, as well as being used in Chukotka, the Russian Federation, and across the Arctic. Um, from Greenland all across uh, the northern Canada, Baffin Island. And so I collected uh, some pictures of the kinds of uses that walrus uh, bones and tusks and hides have had for some of the native peoples of Alaska. So this is um, a bunch of walrus skulls right in here. And they're actually being used as building material in this slide from uh, about the turn of the century. And so this is a sod structure, and it's got some, um, some stones here. But you're basically using the walrus skulls as a building material 
really innovative, but if, you know, I just was mentioning how heavy they are, they're really solid, and, you know, and if you're living in a place that doesn't have a lot of wood available, walrus skulls make a great building material. Here's another example. This is a slide from Gamble. Um, walrus hide, uh, as well as the bones and the tusk, was an incredibly useful material um, not only for people in the last 100 years, but we think for about the last 2,000 years prehistorically along the coast of Alaska, St. Lawrence Island. Uh, and the, well, how do we know that we have walrus hide that's 2,000 years old? Well, happily for archaeologists, permafrost um, preserves hides and a lot of other organic materials so that we actually can excavate walrus hide that's 2,000 years ago. And yes, it does smell. Um, it's stinky for 2,000 years. It doesn't ever stop stinking. Um, but you can see how useful it would be. And um, if we look here, we've got a, a mo relatively modern example. And it looks as though people were using walrus in a very similar way, at least their hides, for at least the last 2,000 years in certain parts of Alaska. So what else are walrus useful for? Um, Walrus ivory was a material that was traded throughout Alaska, not just along the coast, but also into the interior for, again, about the last 2,000 years. And these are some objects made of walrus ivory. They are curated here at the University of Alaska Museum. And if you get the chance, there's an amazing exhibit with a lot of archaeological um, artifacts, but some of them are, uh, are ivory, made of walrus ivory. So here you have a pair of snow goggles made, uh, again, out of a walrus tusk and with a small sort of linear decoration here. This is part of a harpoon, and harpoons were um, one of the most important technologies used by ancient Eskimo in the area that I'm going to talk about, the coastal region, St. Lawrence Island, and the coast of Chukotka just across the Bering Strait. Uh, again, you can see it's got some just really amazing um, incised decoration here. Uh, and we see that a lot in harpoon um, uh, technology. And then this is called a counterweight. It's sort of to balance a harpoon. And you can see, again, walrus ivory with lots of decoration. This is a small sample of the kinds of things that walrus ivory was used for. Remember, a lot of the coast of Alaska, a lot of the area I'm talking about, does not have access to, to very much wood. So while many native people would be using wood and reeds and other kinds of things as the organic source for a lot of their technology, people living on St. Lawrence Island and along many of these coastal areas didn't have access to wood unless it was driftwood. So instead, they would have to turn to other kinds of raw materials, walrus bone and walrus ivory, very durable, very strong, was uh, one of the materials people turned to as an alternative source. Okay, so how did I get started in, in walrus? I mean, does walrus just sort of jump out as, oh yeah, I'm gonna study walrus, let's devote my life to that. Um, no, actually, the question that um, I started with, uh, with a relatively large research team from both the United States and from the Russian Federation was whaling. Now, whaling to walruses. There's actually a link, and I'll tell you how, how we get there. But one of the big questions for archaeologists is, when did people start hunting whales? Most of us know whales are a really incredible part of the culture of many coastal Alaska Native people. They're also important in um, Chukotka for Native uh, Eskimo and actually Native Chukchi along the coast of uh, the Russian Federation. So. For archaeologists, we want to know when did that start, right? Because the first one is always the most interesting. When did that start? What was the first time that people started hunting whales? Because if you think about it, I mean, who got that idea to actually get in a boat with a bunch of guys and go out and throw a little stick at a big giant sea mammal and then haul it in and then eat it? I mean, whose idea was that? I mean, if you think about it, that sounds like a pretty scary kind of thing to undertake. Um, so. For archaeologists, that's been one of the big questions. When did that start? What made people want to go out and hunt big, giant sea mammals with little sticks? Um, so uh, there was a project that I was part of, and it involved the excavation of a site for an archaeologist that we would consider it an intact site. In other words, a site that pretty much hasn't been disturbed. Everything is where we think it was 
when people left it. Nobody's been digging around in it. No, nothing's been trampling it or plowing it up or anything. And the site is called Nunli Gran, and it's right, um, right there where the little square is. Um, and we were going to go and discover the origins of whaling. Where did people start whaling? Well, we think it was there. We're going to go. We're going to go dig up the origins of whaling. Um, well, great. Okay, whales, massive. You can see this is a photo from Barrow um, pulling a bowhead in. Look and keep a note of how many people are involved, right? And you're only seeing part of the scene. You're only seeing the pulling the whale ashore scene. Um, clearly, whaling is important to people today. Okay, so fast forward to, to the Russian Federation. This is how you travel if you're an archaeologist working in Chukotka. Um, and uh, you can, these are all archaeologists. I know you probably can't tell, but um, they're all archaeologists. Uh, and this is our, um, our friend um, Tim. He's a student at UAA right now, and uh, he went with us. The rest of the folks are um, our Russian colleagues. And the guys got to travel by um, tracked vehicle. Um, and it took three days to get to the site from um, using this lovely mode of transportation. I got to travel by this, um, which was much more convenient, only 12 hours, uh, a cargo ship, which is how a lot of the villages on the coast of the Russian Federation are resupplied. Um, but compared to the tracked vehicle, this was just, it was luxury. So, uh, and notice it's also sunny, looks warm, it's beautiful. One day, okay? Um, this is also, of course, the, later the same day. Notice, you know, a guy with no shirt on. This does not continue, let me assure you. Um, it gets pretty miserable pretty fast. So this is the um, archaeologist taking pictures of the site. Here we are. This is, here's our site. Look at the beautiful um, background here. This is on the coast, the southern coast of Chukotka, and I'm going to show you the map in a minute. Um, and we're basically sort of getting familiar with the site. Well, where is the site? Um, what you know, what are the components of it? How big is it? So you can see that we're sitting, we're sort of standing on this promontory above a bay. Um, so you've got the bay here that's sort of enclosed, and you can't quite tell, but um, it's an enclosed and relatively secure bay. This um, big outcropping right here is full of seabird colonies. So colonial nesting seabirds like puffins, um, murres. So lots of birds in a really small area. Um, and as a result, probably a good place for people to live in the past. Because not only do we know that um, belugas and walrus came and, ha and spent some time in this protected bay, because we saw them, um, but also you've got all these colonial nesting seabirds, which if you're a person who's looking for a good place to live about 2,000 years ago, you want to be near as many different resources as possible. So setting up your village close to colonial nesting seabirds, right? So not only eggs, but also you've got lots of birds in a small area plus a place where you have a really good vantage point of um, any kind of sea critter that's passing, uh, really good spot for a, um, for a site. Okay, so a little bit later in our excavation, this is what it starts to look like. Um, and even though permafrost is really, really difficult to work with as an archaeologist because you can only pull a little bit of permafrost off at a time. It's a really painstaking way to excavate because you can only do a couple centimeters, just like a half an inch at a time, scraping, 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 then let the sun sort of warm it up, and then you can scrape a little bit more. Um, really slow. So I know that this might not look very impressive, but this is the result of six weeks of work. <laughs> Yay. Um, so... <laughs> You think, well, you're not very deep, but actually what you're looking at is a, um, this is about two to 3,000 years old, as far as we can tell, on the basis of the dates we've gotten. Um, so what you're seeing is some rocks, and you're thinking, okay, so some rocks, somebody lived there, and there's some rocks. Um, but uh, another great picture, this is the, um, not, here's a smiling Alaskan archaeologist uh, and a, uh, someone from the local school who came out to take a look at uh, and learn a little bit about archaeology. So this is actually what we work with most of the time. I know you guys often people think that we're out there sort of shoveling stuff, but it's more little trowel, little paintbrush, that kind of thing. It's really a lot slower than people usually think. Um, but 
for me, one of the exciting things was, wow, these are two walrus tusks. Now remember, we're looking for whales, right? Looking for whales, but we find walrus tusks. And not just walrus tusks, but lots of walrus um, skeleton materials, okay? Faunal remains or skeletal remains, lots of them. Um, and so, I mean, I was interested in this whaling thing, but when all this walrus started showing up, that was sort of interesting. Well, why, why is it all this walrus at a whaling site? What, what's going on here? Um, if people were eating whale, why are there all these walrus here? So when we started finding walrus, like these tusks, and these are what we call in situ, they're in the place we think they were when people left that site two to 3,000 years ago. Um, and for an archaeologist, that's a really happy thing when that happens, when people actually leave it, um, because then we can take samples of what's around it. We can take a look at, um, at the pollen, for example, that's attached to those tusks and reconstruct some of the plants that might have been there two to 3,000 years ago. Uh, we can take a look and see if there's any um, carbon or ash from a hearth or from a fireplace that people might have had two to 3,000 years ago. Uh, we can date some of those things and get really good control over what was happening in this small structure 2,000 years ago. Then we started to have um, these show up. These are, if you remember that slide I showed earlier, these are walrus skulls. Um, and for an archaeologist, we would call this a non-random configuration, which is a nice way of saying, um, there's something going on here. It's a pattern, right? That people didn't just drop these walrus skulls and just happen to fall into this nice sort of this nice line. Um, a lot of other walrus remains here too. So here's a walrus scapula. Uh, these are pieces of wood. We haven't still figured out quite what's going on with the wood. We're not sure if this is covering up a cache or if it's part of a floor. Um, not certain yet. But there's clearly something going on with the use of these walrus um, in this non-random configuration. Um, so again, a lot more walrus, no whales. So, you know, I think, oh, well, walrus are sort of cool, you know, let's start looking at walrus. Here's just another walrus shot. Um, just to give you an idea of how big these things are, this is a walrus skull. Um, again, amidst some um, very exciting rocks here. Uh, and seems to be associated with a structure, okay? So, when I got back to the United States, I was pretty interested in these walrus. Um, we didn't find any sort of big giant whale with a big spear in it or something that indicated that any people were whaling, which was, you know, what would have been really great, but rarely happens in archeology. span um, So I said, well, hey, walrus are cool too. You know, if you can't have a whale, how about a walrus? So I came back. And I thought, well, let's start looking at where in Alaska and Chukotka have people been using walrus in the past, okay? So I started looking through all these reports and trying to find archaeological sites from the last two to 3,000 years where people had recovered, archaeologists had recovered walrus remains. And what I found was pretty interesting. Um, up here in Barrow, uh, here in the Seward Peninsula, lots of places on St. Lawrence Island. And look at, here's Chukotka, okay? So it's just across, so here's Nome around here, here's Wales, just across, really close. Bering Strait is right here, and you've got all these sites with walrus remains. Here's the archeological site I started with. Um, so this was a really interesting pattern because we know that people were living at other locations in Alaska. We know people were living in here, people were living in here but there weren't any walrus remains there, okay? Well, they're right on the coast, so why wouldn't there be walrus there? Um, but yet, on these locations, walrus, 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 lots of walrus, lots of walrus here. Um, well, all of these sites have something in common. Uh, if you spend any time with maps, you can probably figure it out, which is they're all located on capes or headlands. They're located on landscapes that sort of jut out into the ocean, jut out into Bering Sea, Bering Strait. They're Prominent, uh, prominent locations on the landscape. Okay, so that started looking pretty interesting to me. Um, again, we had these non-random patterns, right? So this is clearly not just chance. This is not archeological sort of sampling bias, which is something that always concerns archeologists. Are we just looking at certain, uh, at a limited number of samples and so therefore getting sort of a biased view of what was going on in the past? So, 
what I started to think about was, okay, well, walrus are sea creatures. They're fundamentally sea mammals. Um, and people must have somehow located themselves in places where they could get at walrus easily, right? That makes sense. Seems sort of obvious once you start thinking about it. And so I went to some of the recent work on oceanography and biochemistry in the Bering Sea, and there's been a lot of work that's been done there recently. And I turned up this map, among others, and what it shows is some water masses. It's a map of water masses. And you can see there's um, several here that are, um, that are actually depicted here. Uh, Bering shelf water, okay, and then these several other ones. Okay, so what's a water mass? It's basically a river of water that is going through the ocean in a specific direction, okay? Well, that sounds sort of interesting, but why do we care? Well, we care because the composition of these water masses is drastically different from the composition of the other um, water surrounding it. Okay, so if you can imagine a river within the ocean, okay, these water masses carry massive amounts of nutrients. So the kinds of things that phytoplankton and little critters in the ocean like to eat, and of course, the little critters in the ocean support the bigger critters in the ocean, and those guys support the larger critters in the ocean. So you've got this um, trophic um, relationship going on. So somebody's eating somebody else. So what this shows us is that the basic building blocks of these trophic levels, these other upper trophic levels, the basic building blocks, the basic nutrients that everybody needs fundamentally in um, an ocean ecosystem are really very patterned, okay? They're not out here, they're not in here, and they're not in here. They're hitting headlands and capes. Um, and they're especially bottlenecking right here in Bering Strait, okay? Now, if you remember that map and our non-random associations, this isn't by chance. So this is really interesting to me, but something else that's going on here. These are modern, this is a map of modern water masses and their distribution, okay? And the walruses that I'm looking at are about two to 3,000 years old. Okay, here is walrus distribution map, okay? Um, and walrus, you've probably heard about them on the radio or in the news, walrus are in trouble right now because they are ice edge, man. They really require ice, um, ice flows, ice mass to reproduce, um, to rest on, to sleep on, to re um, to uh, rear their young. So as the ice retreats, walrus, like polar bears, are in a lot of trouble. And I know polar bears are the big poster animal, but walrus, to me, walrus are just in just as much danger. Um, and you can see that in the past, they lived much farther south than they did today. This is their current distribution, okay? In here and up here, all right? So current distribution, okay? Back to our original site map. What, when you put all these maps together, what you've got is these sites are mapping walrus migration patterns, okay? In other words, people are living at the points where walrus are most likely to pass by in the spring and in the fall. So they're hanging out at this cape that sticks right out into Bering Sea. Um, they're living here on Gamble, and Gamble's been occupied for at least 2,000 years. They're living at Wales. They're living um, on Cape Dejnev right here, Point Hope. They're living in places where walrus are gonna pass. Now, from a biological standpoint, the really interesting thing is that these locations of archeological sites match the locations where modern walrus pass. So what that tells me, what that suggests, is that we have a long time depth for walrus behavior and migratory, migratory patterns. Not only are the walrus pretty stable in their migratory patterns, perhaps as much as 3,000 years, but these water masses also appear to be pretty stable in terms of how they flow, where they go, when they go. Um, and they're hitting, now you'd say, well, okay, well, this is a bottleneck, right? Of course, it has to go through Bering Strait. Well, yeah, but it doesn't have to go up under here. And that's how it goes today, these water masses and the walrus. And that's what the sites look like, too. So 
for me, this was pretty exciting because it suggests that walrus migration has time depth. And it means that walrus migration patterns are very stable. And this has conservation implications because it says walrus are really particular. What they like is what they like, and they're not going to, they're, they're very conservative in their behavior choices. They're not going to just move someplace else. They like to be where they like to be. So any kind of conservation plan that we put in place has to consider how conservative walrus are in their habitat preferences, okay? All right, St. Lawrence Island is one of the locations where walrus Historically, and it looks like as much as 2,000 years ago, walrus are, they are the fundamental building block of society on St. Lawrence Island. Um, people live up here today. This is Gamble. It's the largest um, village on St. Lawrence Island. Um, and this, can you see that little point? Uh, is a happy walrus point, right? The walrus go right by there. So people are living right on that cape where they know the walrus are going to be at specific times of year. Not incidentally, I think, there's also a lot of colony nesting seabirds in this area. So people are picking where they live in the past very, very carefully to exploit the largest number of different species, birds, marine mammals, um, and possibly fish. We're starting to see some interesting fish evidence too, but we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, this is what St. Lawrence Islanders in the past are using to hunt walrus, okay? This is an ivory harpoon head. Uh, it's from the University of Alaska Museum. You can see some of them on exhibit. Um, and it's made out of a walrus tusk. So I don't know how walrus would feel about getting killed by a walrus tusk. I don't know, that sort of seems odd. But um, you've also got, these were um, walrus tusk um, harpoon heads that we found at the site we worked on in um, Chukotka. And this is how it works. This is a toggling harpoon head. So when you get um, somebody with a really strong arm who hurls your harpoon, this actually goes way far in and embeds itself in, um, in some cases, the actual bone. That's where you really want it to stick because it's not going to come out of the bone. Um, and then you have, you can see this lashing, which is uh, attached to it. So once you're not expecting to actually kill the walrus with one fell swoop, okay, with your harpoon, what you're hoping is that harpoon embeds itself in the really thick blubber or the bone of the walrus. Then you attach a float, and floats were often inflated seal skins um, to the walrus, and then you can pretty much let the walrus run until it's exhausted because it can't go, it can't go under, way underwater because it's got attached to the float. So um, that seems to be one of the ways that people were uh, exploiting walrus in the past in St. Lawrence Island. Um, I collected some examples of how people used walrus uh, ethnographically. In, in other words, in the recent past, the last 200 years, as a way to see how those ways compared to what people were doing prehistorically. Okay? So the idea was, okay, let's see, find examples of what people do now, and then look at the archaeological materials to see if we can match those up. Um, and this was a really interesting one, um, which is this um, fellow holding walrus tusks to, um, to take a bear. This is actually um, a print made by a native Chukchi person from Ulan, which is a site in um, Chukotka. Here are some other examples. Um, walrus scapula shovels. These are really, really common. Remember, no wood, right? No wood. Um, so you've got to make do with what you have. Walrus scapula shovels seem to be pretty darn common. Um, and here, this is an example from St. Lawrence Island. Remember we talked about how good the preservation is because of that permafrost. So you actually have a piece of the wood, the limited wood, and you would have kept the wood and tried to use it in as many ways as possible, um, actually attached to that scapula shovel. This is probably about 1,000 years old, this particular illustration. Um, these are walrus teeth. And walrus teeth are these really dense pieces of ivory. People were using them as bolas. So you basically attach some kind of twined material to a walrus tooth. You drill a hole, and then you swing it. And 
if you're, if you're good at it, you hurl it and it actually wraps around some prey animal. We think this is probably birds, but we, we're not sure. Um, so bolas made out of walrus teeth. This, to me, is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. These are both uh, walrus bones, um, a phalanx, which is like a finger or toe bone, and an astragalus, which is a, um, another bone of the, uh, the, the hand or uh, foot. Um, these were both found with sinew um, attached to them. And those are pretty interesting. These are, happen to be about 2,000 years old, but we know that bone was a really important material to be used as an amulet, um, certainly in the last 200 years, that people would carve a stone or perhaps carve uh, a piece of ivory into an animal or take a part of an animal and wrap it with sinew or baleen or something and wear it as an amulet. So that was pretty interesting, because we don't know much about the beliefs of people in the last 2,000 years, right? How, what did they think about walrus? Were they just something to eat, or was it, was it more complicated than that? This is another interesting ethnographic example, a recent example of how people are thinking about walrus. And as you can see, it's a walrus, but it's got the face of a person here. Um, and this example is explained as uh, a walrus inua. So the walrus has like a little person, like a little, uh, little um, spirit. We would probably say spirit. We don't have any perfect translation for the word inua, which is um, uh, an Anupiak term. But it's sort of like the walrus spirit. And here the artist is saying, okay, here's our walrus, but the walrus has a person. It's, it's a person inside it. It's a spirit or a soul inside it. So that was pretty interesting to me. Um, and I wanted to, to look at, is it possible that this kind of belief was also operative in the past? I mean, did people 2,000 years ago think about walrus that way? Um, when you kill a walrus, does the walrus sort of have a personhood? Is there a spirit in the walrus? And if so, how does that affect how you treat it? Um, and so I started looking for examples of this kind of thing. And I wasn't really sure what I was looking for at first, right? Um, we didn't find any of these at our archaeological site. But what I did find was this. This is a site called Gekka II, and it's in, um, on the coast of Chukotka. And all of these red... Uh, these little objects that I've highlighted in red are walrus skulls, okay? So I want you to think about, like, here's your house. It's a big house, too. So this is a structure you're looking down on. It's called a plan view for archaeology. Here's your entranceway, um, and you've got all these walrus heads all over the place, okay? To me, this is pretty interesting because... This looked like my non-random association of walrus heads at my site. So I started collecting examples of uses of walrus heads. And what I started to see is that people seem to be taking walrus heads and intentionally placing them in, in locations that they then return to. And it seems like there's some kind of ritual activity going on. I found a couple of other sites that have these special walrus the Russians have called them sort of walrus altars. Um, I don't know if we'd call them an altar, but clearly people are feeling like walrus have some kind of ritual or religious meaning to them. So back to walrus um, and our modern day pokes. Um, trying to reconstruct what people were thinking about walrus in the past is pretty hard, but it's pretty clear that people at certain points along the coast of Alaska and the coast of Chukotka and on St. Lawrence Island were completely dependent upon walrus in the past. Well, how does this relate to whales? Because that's how I started. Walrus take a lot of energy and people to hunt. Uh, they're 2,000 pounds. This is actually a small one. Um, and you can see you've got four guys standing here with a lot of rope. Here's an umiak right here. Um, here's another walrus head you can see sitting right here. Walrus take a lot of people to hunt them. It's really hard to hunt female walruses and baby walruses out by yourself because you have to, remember, go out to those ice flows. So I started thinking, well, if you need that many people to hunt walrus, today or in the recent past, you probably needed that many people to hunt them in the past. This is a modern example of um, 
trying to, here's a, this is a snowmobile, and obviously people in the past didn't have snowmobiles, but they would have to get up and down these ice ridges in order to get to where the walruses were. So what this suggested to me was that you need a lot of people, okay? Sometime in the last two to 3,000 years, people started getting together to hunt walrus. And this is really interesting to an archeologist, and I hope to you guys, because something has to happen socially for people to decide, well, I would rather work together with all these other people rather than just standing over my, my ice fishing hole right here and just working on my own, okay? This is what in archeology span we call the development of social complexity. Why did people decide to start working together? And what I'm working on right now is the idea that hunting walrus was a stepping stone to whales. So in other words, people didn't go just from hunting halibut or just from hunting seals at breathing holes to hunting whales. They used walrus as sort of a midpoint, as a way to get there, okay? Because if you think about it, hunting a, wa hunting a seal at a breathing hole versus going out and hunting whale with 12 people in, a, in an umiak, that seems like quite a leap. I think small groups of people started getting together because walrus were a better way to, to live. And this requires people to come together in villages and create these complex social structures that allows lots of people to work together. Because the only way that you can hunt these marine mammals, these large marine mammals like walrus or later whale, is by carefully working together, having a leader, who today we call an umalic in, up in Barrow, um, and having a closely knit social group. So that is what I'm working on now. How did we get to here? I think walrus are, are the key. I think walrus are how we got to whales. And without understanding how um, we, you can't understand the origins of whaling without understanding what came before and what led us into whaling. So I think walrus are the key to whaling. And I know that doesn't really sound like it, it doesn't make obvious sense, but I think that's where we're going. So for me, that's what I'm interested in right now, is looking at walrus and reconstructing their role in the past as a way to figure out how we got to where we are today. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>